How many here, and I know probably not many that are going to answer yes to this, how many here like to shop? Shop. Well, there's a few guys. I love shopping. You know, the, my, uh, my wife, uh, her co-worker was so envious because uh, uh, I love to shop, I love to cook, I love to talk on the phone. And they're always like, you're not a typical guy, are you? And I said, well, no. It's like, you know, I say the same thing about being Chinese. I'm not a typical Chinese guy because I'm, I'm, you know, a little smaller than average. But, um, <laughs> but I love to shop. And, and one of my favorite things to shop for is groceries. Uh, Tracy and I have been married for 25 years. And we love going grocery shopping together. And we love to go to the store. And, see, back in the day, grocery shopping was really fun. We used to play music when we went down the aisles. You know, you push the car, just kind of move you along and dance along to whatever, whatever music is playing. But now when you go to the grocery store, they don't play music anymore. All you hear is, or, you know, honey, I have some special in the deli for 99 cents. You know, that's all you hear. And when you go to the grocery store, you watch people, like you go to superstore especially, they're grumpy. They're like, gotta get in here, get what I need, get out. So much. And when it comes to shopping too, I love shopping for Christmas because I love I love buying things for people, especially my kids. Like when my kids were growing up, their stockings, you know, my wife got these big stockings, made these big stockings for the kids, and they're always like, you know, the horn of plenty. But like they, they would be like there would be the stocking and be a box inside with the stocking full of stuff that I would get for Christmas. Because I love shopping. And Christmas time to me is the time where it should be a blast to go shopping. But when you go to those malls, you look at the faces of people who are Christmas shopping, they're not very happy. They're just grumpy because I can't find what I need. You know, Joey wants this RC thing and I can't find it. You know, they're just mad and grumpy. People in our culture today, I find, are so less happy. That life has become so serious that everything has become a chore and a task. And even in our culture, we have so much money. If you think about the affluence that we have, you know, especially in Canada, uh, where I live in Calgary, in Tuscany, we live in a townhouse, but you know, we're like entry level housing. But in, in Tuscany, the average household income in Tuscany is between $170,000 and $190,000. And yet, some of the people there are the wealthiest people you'll ever meet. Even our prime minister does not say anything about him. But the fact is, you know, we have all this affluence. Yet in our attitudes and the way we approach life, we're not very thankful. We're not very grateful. We're always like, just, there seems to be something just eating at us. But I think, you know, especially for us as Christians, I think being thankful is one of the most important things, one of the most important attitudes that we can have in our lives. And today we're going to look at a portion of scripture, a story, that I think is very important because it really demonstrates, I think, what we can be like as Christians in our attitudes towards God, towards Christ, as far as being thankful for our lives and things we have. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 17, and we're going to look at uh, a familiar story if we grew up in Sunday school. <clears throat> Verses 11 to 19. And Jesus now is, uh, is uh, on his way to Jerusalem. And it says here, starting in verse 11, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We have to gather here to lift up the name of Christ, to celebrate, Lord God, what you've done for us and what you continue to do in and through us. And Lord God, as we look into your word today, I pray, God, that you would, through your spirit, touch our hearts and minds, Lord God. If there are things in our hearts and minds that need to change, 
in our attitudes, in our perception of life. God, I pray that you would do that. The Father, help us, Lord, to be attentive to you. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in this passage, we have this story that we all know, you know, the story of these lepers who come to Jesus. And leprosy in that day was one of those, you know, almost like AIDS today. When you hear that, people just kind of pull back. Because leprosy, you know, in the Old Testament law, you were unclean. And to go and be near someone who was a leper and make you unclean. So they were sort of cast off in society. And it says, you know, there were ten of them. And I also found it interesting that they, were, they made sure to include the fact that one of them wasn't a Jew. You know, that there was a Samaritan there, someone who was half Jewish, someone who the Jewish people looked at in a negative light. And they came to Jesus, and they came to Jesus asking for help. Because Jesus was probably well known. I mean, he was probably well known in the area, you know, for doing, for teaching, but also for healing and doing many miracles. And they came to Jesus asking him to help them. And Jesus embraced his love. He heals them. And he tells them to go to the priests. Because it was the priests they had to go to for them to be declared clean. So when the priest would look at them and say, oh, you cure it, then they could go out and sort of mingle with everybody else and everything would be okay. So they went, and as they went, of course, they found that they were friends. But then the one came back, the Samaritan came and thanked Jesus. But then Jesus asked the question, what about the other one? And why is it the only one who comes back and seeks, you know, to thank me? is the Samaritan, this form. So I started thinking about that. I started thinking about why didn't all of them come back and thank Jesus? I mean, if you were in that, you know, one of those ten, you think, you've got this disease, you've been cured and cleansed, wouldn't you want to thank the person who healed you? Why didn't they? But then I started looking at my own life. You know, and I think sometimes when when interesting things or great things happen to us, you know, we can get caught up in a moment, can't we, in excitement. You think about Christmas morning when you're a kid, right? You, you've been, you know, bugging mom and dad for a certain toy or something like that, and then you open it up on Christmas Day, and you're just so enthralled with it, right? You start playing with it, you just want to do some great things, and then you hear mom and dad say, are you going to thank dad for that, or Uncle Bill for that, or whatever? Like, because we, we just get so caught up in the moment. And maybe these guys, you know, they were so caught up, maybe they were yelling at the priest and saying, hey, you know, I'm going to their family and friends, and they, were, they just totally forgot how it happened and who did it. But here's another thing that I think may have happened, and this is why I think the specific here, mentioning that the one person who thanked God was a Samaritan, was I think maybe the other nine were probably Jews felt entitled. They probably felt entitled. Because here, this Jewish rabbi, Jesus, was going around teaching and healing. And they figured, hey, we're Jewish. We'll go to Jesus. He healed them and thought, hey, of course he did. Because, you know, I'm one of God's people. I mean, you know, God has to bless me. So they maybe had a sense of entitlement that God was just going to do it for them. And I say that because I think as Christians, sometimes we have the same attitude when it comes to our relationship with God. That we kind of expect God to do things for us. You know, when God answers our prayers, you know, sometimes we act like those Jews and just kind of go, oh, that's nice. Or just, you know, think it's just a great coincidence or whatever. Or do we really thank God the way this Samaritan did? Because I think it's really cool. You think about this. You look in the passage here in verse 15. He says, when one of them, when he saw him was healed, came back praising God. Now, we just didn't come back going, That God had answered his request. How often do we do that? How often do we really praise God for what he's done in our lives? I think it's important for us to be thankful. And I think there are many reasons for us to be thankful. And I just want to share a couple of those. And the first one is the fact that God provides for us. You know, you look at the things you have in your life, the resources you have. It could be practical things, it could be a vehicle, it could be a home, a good job, you know, wealth, stuff like that. It could be family. How often do we thank God for His provision? 
You know, you look at our culture today. You look at all the things that we have and we compare ourselves to other places in the world. We have so much. Yet how many of us in our own hearts <coughs> get envious of other people? When they have a new vehicle, a new toy. You know, you go to work and somebody has the newest phone. You think, or go to school and you think, oh, I want that. I want that. How many of us do that? How many of us are thankful for just maybe the flip phone that you might have? Or maybe just thankful for having a phone at all? Mm -hmm. We need to thank God for what He's done for us. You know, we, we get so pulled in many directions, you know, whether it's advertising. You know, you can watch advertisements on TV, you know, if you're single, you think, oh, you can go to Moxie's and find a girl. Because that's single for all the action is. Well, do you see the ads on Moxie's now? But, you know, there's just so much, though, you know, it, it's sort of if then. You buy this product, you wear ads, you know, you're going to get the women. Actually, I think you're going to turn them away wearing ads. But, you know, we, 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 get, we get bombarded with all this stuff, you know, if you do this, this will happen. But in James 1.17, this is what James writes. He says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You see, the things we have in our lives, God is the one who brings them in. He provides things for us. And you know, sometimes God provides things in strange ways, not the ways that we expect. Um, I was reading a, a story about uh, Cory Tenkin, I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She lived in... Uh, in uh, Germany uh, during World War II, and her and her family would protect Jews who were trying to escape the Nazis. And what happened was, Ocean, oh, I can't remember, but she was protecting Jews, but she got arrested. Her and her family were, were, were found out by the Nazis, and they were thrown into these, uh, these prison camps. And when you're a young woman in a, in a prison, as a prisoner of war, you were treated very badly by the guards. You were really abused, and you hear atrocities today of what happened. But that was what was happening in Germany as well. But this is how God protected them. The cell they were in was infested with fleas. Now, of course, the grass looks like this gross. Little fleas jumping around. But the Germans hated fleas. So they wouldn't go in there and bother them because their cell was infested by fleas. So in a strange way, God protected them, provided them protection by infesting their cell with fleas. I read another story about a mission organization about 100 years ago in the U.S. They had rented an old brewery and turned it into a mission, like a, like a mustard seed kind of thing, to, to provide that social justice thing, help to people who are homeless and, and hungry and stuff like that. And the, the rent came up, the bills came up, the rent came up, and they didn't have the money to pay the bills. And the uh, guy from the, uh, the landlord was going to come the next day and wanted all his money. So they prayed that night, said, God, provide for us. The next morning, the whole property was covered with mushrooms. And they sold all those mushrooms. I mean, this is a true story. They sold all the mushrooms, paid all their debt off, and had enough money left over to, to continue funding the ministry for months and months. God provides. And sometimes I think we take that for granted. Instead of really seeing God's hand that work in our lives, God, even in the little things, God works. And we need to give Him praise and thanksgiving. The second reason, which I think is probably very important, that many of us maybe forget oftentimes, is that we're commanded to be thankful. You know, sometimes we think, well, yeah, I'll be thankful if I want to, but in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 it says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Because sometimes in our lives, things you kind of go, I'm not sure I'm thankful for that. Like I told the story last week when we came, we were, my wife and the, our son were coming into Edmonton, coming up Gateway Boulevard and uh, going up the one way and a guy turned the other way right at us. Was I thankful for that? No, I was not thankful for that. That point I probably was thinking some other things. But you know what I'm thankful for? It was for the safety that God gave us. The fact that we didn't have a kind of operation. And you know, sometimes we get caught up in the negative part that we miss the part so we're commanded to be thankful. And the reasons why we should be thankful to God is for a couple of reasons. Because number one, I believe it glorifies God. You think
think what the man who was healed, he came back praising God. He was just screaming out, thank you God, thank you. You see, we need to understand that God is active in our lives. I think too often we see God as just out there, right? You know, it's like that old Bette Midler song, God is watching us from a distance. The reality is, God is active in our lives. If you are a Christian, the Bible says that God's spirit lives in us. That God dwells us as human beings, but he dwells, he dwells us by the spirit. That God is with us. And so when we thank God for what he's done in our lives, we glorify his name. But it also helps us to acknowledge our need to God. Because what it does, when we praise God and thank Him, what it does is we acknowledge our need for Him. It's like saying to God, thank you for what you've done. I need you in my life. You see, we tend to do things sort of as independent you know, people. We try to go do our thing, you know. I mean, we have now this new network, the you know, DIY network. Do it yourself, right? And I think we try to live our lives that way a lot. When I was serving as an associate pastor in my first church, uh, there was a, I've been there for about six years, and the senior pastor got sick with cancer. And uh, so in, in his treatment, he had a tumor on his spine, and they were treating him with radiation that literally almost cooked his lungs. So he was off for 10 months. And then the, 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 the board said, well, we're going to hire another pastor to come in and intern. And I said, no, we got Brian. He'll do it. He'll do all this stuff. And I was like, okay. You know, it's a church of about 300. We have about 300 and some people attending on Sundays for their services. And so for the first month, you know what? I did it. I just gave her. You know, I'm running on a triple and it's like all the preaching, all the other stuff, trying to oversee all the youth stuff, and the Christian education stuff. I was doing it all. I was amazing. After a month, God showed up. I was in my office and he smacked me on the head and said, uh, Brian, Remember me? I'm here. And, you know, it was a wake-up call. Because uh, here I was, doing this all on my own strength, trying to be Superman, Super Pastor, when the reality was, God said to me, remember, it's me through you. And it was humbling. I can't say it was very fun that day in my office, as uh, I really had to talk to God in that series of you see, our culture teaches us to be independent. And I mean, in many ways we should be, right? We, 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 we cut ties with our parents, we have our own families, we, 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 we become our own you know, family units and stuff like that, and we grow and we do things on our own. But in the overall picture of life, we shouldn't be living our lives apart from God, <coughs> and God. That God needs to be in everything in our lives. We need to acknowledge Him in all things. You know, it seems like the more wealthy and affluent our culture becomes, the less dependent and open we are to God. I mean, you, you hear so many stories of what's going on in places like Africa and South America and China. You know, how the gospel is just spreading like crazy. People are coming to Christ. Why? Why? Because they have needs. They have nowhere else to go. Whereas here in North America, it seems like, why bother? Why bother? Because I have everything I need, everything I want. It's all accessible. Why do I need God? We need to depend on Him. We need to thank Him. Because as we do that, I think that God really, you know, just comes in and becomes more of a reality in our life. But you know what? The other reality is this. Sometimes we aren't thankful because, you know, as was shared earlier, things don't go the way that we plan. You know, we have plans, we want things to go a certain way, and, and sometimes we don't, we become discouraged. Sometimes we become discouraged, sometimes we want to give up. Sometimes we just try to live in denial, or just, you know, oh, oh, everything's okay, everything's okay. But the reality is, you know, discouragement is not part of life. And you know, we can't give up. We have hope as Christians. We have hope. I just want to share a few stories of people who didn't give up. These were people weren't Christians necessarily. Anybody ever heard of Colonel Sanders? Kentucky Fried Chicken? Anybody ever liked Kentucky Fried Chicken? <coughs> Colonel Sanders, the story of Colonel Sanders is quite amazing because he didn't actually start 
his chicken business until he was 65 years old. And this is how he did it. See, he was kind of retired. And he thought, what am I going to do? He says, well, I know how to make chicken. And that's a great recipe. And so he made some chicken. And to promote his business, he went door to door. So he knocked on the first door. Would you like some chicken? Slam! Next door. Would you like some chicken? Slam! He did this for 1,009 doors before somebody got it. 1,000, and how many would, would have quit after 10 or maybe 100? He went 1,000, at the 1,010th door he got to and knocked on before somebody tried to kick him, and as they say, the rest is history. To me, that's just such a story of this perseverance and moving forward. Then we have people like uh, Dr. Seuss. You know, I think all of us probably read Dr. Seuss books when we were kids. His first books were rejected by 27 publishers. John Grisham, one of the best authors in our day, was rejected by 28 publishers. J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, rejected by 12 publishers. Michael Jordan, cut from his high school basketball team. Can you imagine these people, if they just decide, oh, forget it, I quit. Now these people aren't Christians. But we who are Christians, how many of us have felt the same way? I thought, you know, this isn't going the way I thought or the way I wanted it. But I think as Christians, I believe that we need to face our lives and sometimes these discouraging times. We need to face them with optimism and we need to face, face them with faith. And I think there's ways we can do that. And the first way is this. Know who's on your side. Know who's on your side. How big is your God? If I ask you, how big is your God? You say, this big, this big, bigger than me? But I think many times, though, when we go through life, our view of God is so much smaller than what we really think. We think we have this great view of God. You know, you read the psalm, like Psalm 97, it just draws this amazing picture of God. You read Genesis, the fact that God created everything, sustains our whole universe. Amazing. Yet, when it comes to facing the challenges we face in life, how big? The second way we can face life with optimism and faith is we have to know the promises. The Bible is filled with so many promises of God. So many. And I think oftentimes we, we kind of look at these words in the black and white, or our first have red letters, you know, all this stuff. We, we often we read them, but we don't actually allow them to sink into our hearts and minds. Those promises of God. You know, we know verses like the Great Commission, like go into the world. Make disciples of all nations, baptized, teaching and baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a great verse. But the next verse is the key to that first verse. He says, For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You know, sometimes we look at the tasks that are before us, the challenges that we face in life, and we think, Oh, I don't know if I can do it. But the reality is that Christ has promised to be with us. And because our God is so big, we can face those challenges. And the last thing is we need to trust his character. You know, we say we trust God. And I've, I've said this, and I might have said it here, but I've said it in other places. You know, we used to say, I trust God with my eternity, right? our eternal life. We trust our souls to God, but we trust our today and tomorrow to God. Psalm 145 is one of the, the best psalms for talking about God's character. In verse 13 it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. God, God's character, his love for us goes beyond circumstances. No matter what we think we're going through that we can't endure, God will give us grace and strength. As even with temptation, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken us. But such is common to man that God is faithful, and with that temptation, we provide a means out of escape. You know, there's always an answer. And sometimes we get so caught up, you know, in, in, in our problems and our struggle, that we often don't see that light at the end of the time. But trust His character. Trust God in who He is. 
I was reading a story about a man who uh, was shipwrecked on an island, kind of like a Robinson Crusoe kind of guy. And over time, with a lot of hard work, he built a hut to protect himself from the elements. And, and you know, he was, he was making you know, things to survive and they're doing quite well. But unfortunately, one day, his hut burned down. And he was devastated. He was choked. He was so mad. He got mad at God because I got this hut now, you know, now what am I going to do? My hut is gone. However, the result of his hut burning down, he didn't realize that there was a ship passing by. And the ship saw the smoke and came by and rescued. You know, sometimes in our lives, we don't see the good from situations. But ultimately, even though we may not see it in ourselves, we need to recognize and trust that God's hands in all these things. That no matter what happens around us, what circumstances there are, that ultimately our lives are in His hands. That He wants His best for us. You know, as Christians, our lives are no different than anyone else. We all have good days. We all have bad things. But because of our faith in the one who oversees all things, our attitudes should be different. How we look at life should be different. We should see every day that we have as a gift from God, from our loving Heavenly Father. And we should live our lives with that hope in mind. You know, in our scripture reading, ten lepers received a wonderful gift. It's the same gift from Jesus. Get only one of them. So my hope and prayer for each of us here is that as we experience God's grace, as we experience the blessing of knowing Him in our lives, that we would respond with the same attitude of great things to God for who He is and what He's doing in our lives. And it's simple. It's three words. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And in the words of the couch of Indian back in my hometown, I just can't. You know, I've often said, you know, as Christians, we should be the most joyful people. We should be the most grateful and thankful people in this world, too. Because through Christ, God gave us all to us that we might experience eternity.